the uh, consequences of what is happening in China are already there in the uh, slowing down of trade. And of course, for an open economy, as we are, uh, trade is very important. For some European member states, is particularly important. And so the slowing down of trade is already having consequences. Um, the concern on the future perspective, uh, how will the real estate situation in China evolve, is already uh, a concern for us. Overall, um, I think that we uh, should uh, still uh, make all the possible effort uh, to keep the low level of growth that we have going, because we are not destined uh, to a recession. We still have a good carryover from the expansion after the COVID crisis, but of course in very troubled waters. So how we will manage this transition phase will be crucial to avoid the recession. My take is that we still can avoid recession in Europe. The well, that's a very interesting. I mean, you've, you've sort of taken us somewhere else, and I just want to come back to China because I don't want to let you off the hook here. The whole energy issue, it's, a, it's an external shock that is going to hit different countries unevenly. I think you've made that point before. A, an increased frictional trade war with China, which ultimately may be the direction we're heading in, um, will also be a significant external shock that will hurt Germany perhaps more than other countries. It will be unevenly felt. Is it going to happen? Uh, sure, energy is affecting especially uh, countries of Eastern Europe, Germany, Italy for gas. Um, trade with China is especially affecting Germany. This is the picture among European member states. Where are we going from this point of view? Well, I think we should um, very clearly state that we need a more secure globalization, so to say, so shortening the supply chain, having um, not the low cost of our supply chains as the top priority, but also security, because this is the lesson of these months. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that we will move towards autarky um, among uh, like-minded. Uh, we will not have a, a closure of our economy. So how to keep very clearly um, security of our supply chains as a priority, but at the same time without closing. Because declaring the end of globalization will, could not be a smart move from the economic point of view, for Europe at least. Paolo, if I can bring it back to Europe and to the European Union as well, people have quite rightly lauded Western unity, whether it be NATO, whether it be G7, whether it be the European Union. But there are thorns in that side. There is Turkey for one, but specifically within the EU. We have a hungry problem again, don't we? And Viktor Orban declaring a state of emergency and potentially ruling by decree, that brings back a lot of concerns that you and other commissioners had way before the current crisis as well. What does, your, what does the Commission do about Viktor Orban and, and his potential to upset European Union? Uh, well, first, I think we are all impressed by the fact that the European Union was able to react in a very united way to the two, uh, two crises we had, pandemic and Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am still confident that we can try to reach an agreement also on the last package of sanctions uh, before the European Council, which is taking place at the end of this year. Not sure, but we are working for this, as the President said in, in CNBC a few, a few hours ago. But at the same time, I think we should be very clear on the fact that being the European Union, a player that is supporting rule of law, and rights of the people all over the world, we can't accept the idea that we made exceptions within the European Union. And this is an issue of discussion with Hungary.
Yeah. Um, let me get back to the economy as well. Um, I know that you would have loved to be able to make progress on updating the growth and stability rules, on, on bringing it up to where we are in reality. We have spoken about this a couple of times before. But are there limits to uh, the fiscal largesse or the relaxing of the rules we're seeing? I spoke to Mikhail Darnberg uh, the other day um, of Sweden, and he's worried, actually, about acceptance of higher debt levels, building debt upon debt, crisis upon crisis, which is going to leave Europe hamstrung and uncompetitive and in a dangerous situation in an inflationary environment. Uh, I understand all these concerns. We are in a transition phase. Of course, we were in a universal support uh, situation facing the pandemic. Now we have to move towards a situation where our fiscal stance will be neutral and we will, we will need to target and make temporary measure of support because otherwise we are not uh, addressing the crisis as we should. But this, of course, doesn't mean that we should tighten um, our economies, because we have also an enormous opportunity in this crisis. Just think to the fact that the European Union was trying to be on the lead of the climate transition. And just think to the fact that we have now uh, the opportunity and the need to be independent from an energy point of view. These two opportunities that are interlinked among them are historical for Europe. And indeed, we can use this new crisis to accelerate the climate transition and to gain energy independence. Doing this means also a lot of investments, private investments. I think there is an enormous interest on the climate transition in Europe from private investors, but also targeted support from member states. So it's a balance that we have to find. Of course, we are no more in the free-for-all spending. This is completely excluded. But we are not in a tightening measure for everyone because this would be very dangerous for our economy.